Welcome to Birth. I'm Ash. The conversation you're about to hear I recorded four years ago with my grandfather, Vic. He has died, and I knew I'd want to share these. These are stories he had told me dozens of times, and he obliged me once more when I put a recorder in front of him. He talks a little bit about his background, and... And then uh, he really gets going when I started asking him about the prayer meetings he and my grandmother would attend and later hosted. They were rebels in their own right. And he connected me to the maternal grandmother that I love so dearly after she passed away 20 years ago. And two of my favorite people that have ever existed so, listen in. So tell me, tell me where you were born. Sealand, North Dakota. And how long were you there before you moved to Michigan? Seven years. And you grew up in what church? Lutheran. In the Lutheran church? Yeah. And can you tell me about where your dad's from? Russia. Where? <sighs> I don't remember the city name. Yeah? It's near a uh, big city. Uh, uh, Odessa. Odessa. How yeah. did you know that? Because you told me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just getting you to say it. Oh, okay. Can you tell me about when his family came here? Do you know that story? Do you know the story? I think it was in 1893. I know the story because the German army was going to invade the area, and so the Russia, the German people went and got all their folks back and they all had to go back to Germany before the war. But your dad didn't, your dad's family didn't go back to Germany? Oh no, uh-uh. Why did they come here? Well, wait a minute, yeah. Yeah, his family came from Russia back to Germany. Okay, so they went to Germany first, before For, the United States. Yes, and before Hitler was getting started. Yeah. And uh, they migrated in well, like 1897. Okay. So why did they choose to come to the United States? Well, because there was the land of opportunity, I guess. Yeah. Free land from the government. They're going to get free but, land. Did, well, did your family own the land in North Dakota? Yeah, but they came from Russia, and you had to live on it for five years and work the work the land, and then and then uh, you kept it. It was your farm. So what happened to your family's land later, like after your parents? Passed away. Well, uh, they kept that land till they moved out of North Dakota. And then they sold it. Sold it. Because mm -hmm. they went to Michigan for work. Yes. Yes. During during the war, you said. Well, actually, uh, they yeah, it was during the war time that they left North Dakota and moved to Michigan because of the jobs there. Yeah. So then, okay. So then you grew up in Michigan. Your father works in like the. Like he was in worked in a foundry. Yeah, like in a factory. Yeah. Okay. And then when you turned eighteen, is that when you went into the army? Were you eighteen when you went in? Oh no. Uh -uh. Or when you were drafted? No. When I got out of high school, I got a good job at Kaiser Fraser Corporation. Ah. Oh. A clerical job. So when you when were you drafted? Two years after I started work, I was drafted when I was twenty years old. Two years okay. after high school. And that was during Korean War. Yes, it was. Uh -huh. And did they, right after basic training, they sent you to Germany right away? Yes, that's what they did after four months of training. And I couldn't get it. I tried to get a job in the States, you know, with my career as a computer operations, but they said there's no openings. So they sent me to Germany as a tank driver. You know how to, do you still, would you remember now how to drive a tank? That's pretty cool. Well, it was like how many, what, 50, 60 years ago? Yeah, the tanks have changed. Improved. Yes, I probably couldn't drive a new one. Yeah. So, so what did you do? You never really have explained what your day-to-day -day job was in Germany. Really? When they, well, you talked about when they switched you over to a different base because yeah. you had IBM yeah. experience. But you never actually explained what was your actual job. When you got up in the morning to do any kind of work, what did you do? Well, I'll tell you what, it was a real surprise for me and I suppose some others that I got taken out of the 
tank driving group because they said they needed IBM operations people in another city. So I had to go leave all my buddies and go to this place myself, Eder Oberstein, Germany. So you were really, you didn't have any other uh, people that you worked with? You didn't have a commander or anything? Oh yes I did, but I, I had to leave all the buddies I that I trained with in Kentucky for four months. So then what did you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Like if you get up in the morning, what was your responsibility that day? Didn't have any when I got, <laughs> no. We got special privilege because we were a small group of 40 people that uh, worked in the IBM department in Germany in, this ba in the base. And so you were kind of just there in case? Mm -hmm. Like you were just there in case someone needed you? Oh no, I, ha I had to work, but not daytime. Oh. We had to work from, uh, it was an afternoon shift, and I, we worked from, uh, oh, like six o'clock to 11 or something. So you just had random duties? No, no, they were regular duties every day. So what was your regular duty? Well, one of them was to drive a two and a half ton truck to haul the people down to the depot that were afternoon workers. Well, that's real IBM work. Well, that's just something that they attached on the side because where we lived and where I worked, they were like nine or ten miles apart. And so when five o'clock came and we had to go get supper at the mess hall and jump in the truck and go to the uh, supply depot. Okay. So how often did you get to go to Berlin, to like the city? I never went. You never went? No. So what was the big city you were close to there? Uh, uh, it's in my mind right now, but the name's not common. It, it was in the western part of uh, Germany, in the place where I lived, was Eder Oberstein. Okay. But you went to London a couple of times, yeah? Oh, yeah. T took some trips to London. To London. Yeah. You, you just have to go on out to the airport and you wait for an army plane to go to London and you can jump on. And How go. nice is that? Just wait till they got room on a plane that's leaving and going to London. So when you came back after your two years in the Army, mm -hmm. you went straight to working for Ford? No. So what did you do when you first came back? Uh, I worked, came back and I got a job with Chrysler in computer operations. Okay. Chrysler Corporation. Right. Yeah. That's where I started after I got in the Army. How long were you there before you went to Ford? Three years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you met Grandma at Ford. She was working as a secretary? No, I met her at uh, Chrysler. Oh, you met her at Chrysler? Yeah. And she was working as like a secretary or something? Yeah, something. She was up in one floor of the building and I was on the main floor of the building. And how I met her is see, those other single guys in our, in our group there that it was lunchtime and so we'd say, come on, let's come see, the, watch the girls come down the stairs before we go to lunch. And we did that, and we talk, would talk about which one we liked best, and you know who was the best looking, and all that sort of stuff. Making, you know, pa pastime. <laughs> of course, that Joanne Richardson, she sure was cute. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And so you just walked up to her one day, and you were like, "Want to go hang out?" No, actually, I had never talked to her until there was like a <clears throat> a company party or a dance. I don't know whether it was Christmas or New Year's, and I went to that, and that's where I actually met Joanne and danced with her. You asked her to dance? Yeah. And then, then what happened? After that it was just it, or you were like, hey, you want to keep going? Well, that's what I said, you want to keep going? She was all excited. Yeah, she said. Well, she thought you were cute too. <laughs> So how long from the time you met her until you guys got married? It wasn't all that. It was under a year. Wow. Moving fast, Grips. <laughs> Ladies, man. And then you had eight kids. Yeah, yeah. So you get to the 1970s, you start going to Catholic Church. And then what happened? Well, we started having babies. And then within, I was still working at Chrysler, but they, they had a big layoff, so uh, I had to find another job, so I went out to Ford Motor Company and applied to Ford Motor Company. But matter of fact, I knew a guy at Chrysler that I worked for before I went in the Army, 
I went back, to, found out where he's working now, and went out there and talked to him at Kaiser. He was doing computer operations supervisor at Kaiser, and they hired me on there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you went, wait a minute, you went from Kaiser to the Army to Chrysler, and then to Ford, or then back to Kaiser for a while? No, no, just one in each. It, you, you had it right. Okay. I worked. When I got out of the Army, I worked for Chrysler first, first. and then after three years, I... Went to Ford. Went to Ford. Okay. And you worked for Ford for how long? 30 years. 30 years? Um, I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah, it yeah, was quite a while. But I'm young. I don't really know anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, and you retired at 50... 50 58. 58? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I was alive by then. I was little. I was young. Yeah. I feel like I remember a retirement party, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, after we got married, because she grew up Catholic and uh, didn't really want to go to any other church but a Catholic church, so and I didn't want us to split up going to church because I wanted to go to a Baptist church. And, but I gave in to my wife's desire. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to be Catholic, so Good man. we got married in a Catholic church. About, you know, what, 1907? When did it start that you guys started, you know... 1969. Well, 1969. Yeah, and we, we already had been transferred to Lima, Ohio. when the, at, From Michigan. At, from Michigan, and that's where we got re involved in the renewal. So, all right, talk about 1969. What happened then? Well, year? that's when we got involved in the Curcio. How did it start? Well, there was something going on at church over the years that I hadn't even known about, that, uh, and it was called the Curcio Movement. Okay. And Curcio Movement had that name because I think it started in like Mexico, but it spread through the United States, that Curcio Movement. And a Curcio, the Curcio Movement was a uh, like a retreat thing for a long weekend, Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, that you went away and had a retreat some other place. It's one of the big buildings there in, in Toledo. And so then, how did you guys get involved? How did you guys decide that you thought that you wanted to be part of this? Well, uh, in the beginning, it started by uh, a associate pastor at St. John's Church uh, that we got to know because we were going there. He called us and asked if we we're interested in doing this Curcio thing, which nobody knew what it was. So you went to just find out. Yeah, so we took a evening or whatever, and, and a bunch of people came that he invited to, that he wanted to talk to us, and he made this presentation about this great movement. It's a spiritual renewal, and he thought we would love to go there. So we did. Cool. And matter of fact, they did the men's retreat separate. I went first, and then a month later, Joanne went with women. So it's either, all right, they were... I went to the men's, and of course she would go to the... She didn't want to go at first, because she, when I was telling her what it's all about, as a, you know, born Catholic, she kind of raised her eyebrows and said, I don't want anything like that. So I had to keep praying until she finally decided to go. And then she... Because I really yeah. liked it. Yeah. Okay. So then what? So after you guys go, and you're convinced that this is a good thing, then what? Well, uh... The uh, after I had gone and she didn't go for two months later, but when she got back, this associate pastor at St. John's Church called a gathering of people, all those people who made a curcio, and he wanted to explain something else to us. What do you want to explain? Well, he wanted to explain the Holy Spirit renewal. And how did you feel about that? I didn't because I, I hadn't done it. Right. For a retreat like that. So, all right, so talk about when you guys finally started helping lead some of the prayer meetings. Well, uh, the same priest that talked about to us about going to the, the uh, Curcio, he's uh, about uh, six months after uh, we had gone to a Curcio, and he invited all the people that he knew in town that went to a Curcio, men and women, mm -hmm. and, he, and he, he mentioned it as a renewal thing of people gathering at the church in the Catholic church and go down in the basement and pray, which Catholics did not do. Bunch of hippies. Huh? Bunch of hippies. <laughs> yeah, that's what we were called worse than a bunch of hippies. 
and it, it got really nasty sometimes. The opposition we had just for having a prayer meeting at church. Like what? Like what did people do? <laughs> well, they said threatening letters to that pastor, saying this is not Catholic, and we we don't know what you're doing, but we don't like it, and we're going to do something about it. So. He was a guy that kind of, well, he shrugged his shoulders. He says, I'm not doing anything wrong except praying with people in the basement of the church once a week. Yeah. It was a charismatic prayer meeting. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Did people ever try and get in and, like, try and, I don't know, threaten you guys in person or anything? Did anybody come into the prayer meetings? And yeah, they did. Yeah. We were at a prayer meeting one night, Sunday night. And the prayer meeting was already in process when all of a sudden three policemen came downstairs and said, who's Father Fleck? He's that guy over there. So the, the three policemen were coming over to tell the priest that there's a lot of threats against us and people around the town. And someone called the police or got him to come there and see if they could stop this thing. And what did the police end up doing? Well, he told us, you know, he says, we came to tell you that there's some, like, threats, there's people messing this prayer meeting up, and he says, it's up to you. You stop. If not, we warned you if, if something happens. So they didn't guard the doors or anything, they just left after but, they told them. Yeah, they told us what they, or in the priest, what was going on, and they didn't, they said there were people threatening us. Were there people outside at that very time? Not that night, no. But there are people who called the police thinking the police would stop the meeting. Yes, they wanted us And the to... police didn't. They just came to warn you. Right, gotcha. right. They came just to warn us. Okay. So, you guys kept going. And the head... Was was Father Fleck the head of St. John's at that point? Or no, he was other... the associate pastor. Yes. That was the other pastor. Was... So, how did the senior... How did the senior priest feel about that? He joined it. Oh, he joined it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Join the hippies. Yes. <laughs> Join the hippie group in a basement. Yeah. <laughs> so how long did that last? How many years did you guys do that? Oh, my gosh. So when Joanne and I got involved and we stayed with it, uh, I'll bet you 20 years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, you guys ended up leading prayer groups, though, in your own house. Yes, we did. Uh -huh. So when did you guys start doing that? Well, uh... We were in a church prayer meeting, and as Father Fleck, he led the church prayer meetings, and then there were some other things happened, which is another long story, and we had to kind of form our own prayer meeting at our house. Well, tell that story. Well, the prayer meetings went on, and we did different things, like we, uh, anybody that wanted to uh, learn about the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit, he held another class, see? And... This was really all Greek to Catholics, baptizing the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's something that uh, you can find it in the Bible, you know, it says we need that. So he held the little classes for the people that wanted to, you know, come to the church and to the special meeting when he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And, of course, Joanne and I went to that. Well, no, here's how he happened. He was doing this in uh, his friend's home, and we were going to a prayer meeting at this guy's house every week and that's where he taught about the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues stuff like that spiritual <laughs> gifts and we were meeting there over two or three weeks there was a uh, Pentecostal preacher from Dayton that Father Fleck invited him to come up and help him teach that Holy Spirit because no Catholics knew anything about this charismatic renewal and so these guys came from the uh, from Dayton, two or three men, a couple of women, to teach us in, the, in that small home about the Holy Spirit. And so after a couple of weeks, since we're getting the input, now these were te Pentecostal people mixing with some Catholics, which is unheard of, and it made the people even more angry in the town, you know. And I think it was about the third week, and they were teaching us about the Holy Spirit each week and what can happen, like being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so at these meetings, they, uh, there was somebody who played a piano or something, and they sang some hymns. And then the, the pastor told us the night we were there. Now, they came into the room, and they said, 
we have taught you, you know, about the Holy Spirit. Now, he said, tonight we're going to pray for baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they had explained it all to us. And then he said, this was not, you know, our pastor and this guy, this pastor from Dayton said, this is not something that you got to do. He says, the people that want to be prayed for, uh, let's go into this other room and those who don't want to or aren't ready you just stay here and so uh, in a bunch Joanne and I went uh, there was a lot maybe 12 people went to be prayed for another 12 stayed back and didn't want to so but they made it so people still got their own choice they weren't going to say you got to do this and so we went in there and he says <clears throat> Well, since you're all Catholics, he says, instead of sitting in the chairs, why don't you guys kneel? We know Catholics kneel when they pray. And so we did that because 98% of us were Catholic. So we just kind of knelt in a circle. And the guy with this Bible, this preacher from Dayton, he walked around the room and he read us passages from Scripture. And we were just quietly listening. And then... Uh, at a point, he said, after he, he encouraged us to be open to the Holy Spirit, so they call it, be open to the Holy Spirit, because we're going to pray for you that you get the gift of tongues. And, well, <laughs> it's another language. Anyway, we were, <clears throat> Joanne and I were kneeling there beside each other and other Catholics kneeling. And so this Pentecostal preacher just kind of walked around the room, and he read from Scripture. He didn't do anything else. He, he just prayed that God would open our hearts and receive the Spirit. And as he walked around the room, uh, praying for people, sometimes laying a hand over them like this over there, and prayed for them, including me and Joanne. Well, after about 10 minutes or so, him, him encouraging us to be open to the Spirit, and nothing, it had nothing to do like you must do it, you know, if you're Catholic, you got it. No, he just encouraged us. If, open to the Spirit, and we should be praying in our minds that we receive God's Holy Spirit. Well, that took only about 10 minutes, and I was kneeling there. All of a sudden, my mouth opened, and I began praying in tongues. <laughs> well, uh, then I think about five or 10 minutes later, some other people got to receive the blessing, and, and then Joanne did, and she was baptized in the Spirit that same night. But she said, because I heard you, she says, I started praying for her too. Because she wasn't quite, she was the Catholic and I wasn't. So I was more open to that than other people because I had a Baptist background. And But she was baptized in the Holy Spirit that night, and it was just, our whole world changed. Then we began prayer meetings every week, and of course, in our prayer meetings, those people who could pray in tongues, they did. And you know, when we had prayer time, other people just prayed in English, but they wanted to be there at the meeting. Uh, in the church basement, and the meetings kept growing because they invited public people from other places. But <laughs> you never started your own church or anything; just kept at the prayer meetings. Huh? No, just prayer meetings. Church I, in the basement. Pardon me. Church in the basement. <laughs> church in the basement. Yeah, and. Uh, it began to look like many of the people who were coming weren't Catholic. They were curious that Catholics would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, like people from other churches. Yeah. They were interested in the prayer group. They were invited to come and join join us every week. You let everybody come in, though. Oh, huh? You let everyone come. Well, sure. Anybody that wanted to. And, uh, of course, some of them uh, were aware of the teachings in, that we, we just learned, you know. And that went on, the prayer meetings and church went on for quite a long time. And it kept growing. And the people in the city were getting madder and madder because we had Pentecostal pre preachers praying for us to receive the baptism. And that was so foreign. They didn't know anything about it. And they said, you know, they're sitting down there in the basement every having prayer meetings. And some of them pray in tongues or sing in tongues. They were taught, that's what they taught. Catholics don't do that. The Catholics don't do that. Never learned that in a Catholic church. Thank you for humoring me. Gramps, may you rest in power. <laughs>